I knew it would happen, dear Christian friends. People would show up this morning who love to be satisfied. But not by me. From God's word. I know how it is when life is filled with all kinds of challenges and you want some satisfaction in your life. So what can you do? Oh, I got an idea. Let's buy a new car. Eh? Is that one of the most satisfying things you do? You go out, you go shopping, and you know, now you can go online, you can compare shop, you get the best deal. You can go look at them. You can, what kind of bells and whistles do you want? You want heated seats, air-cooled seats, you want remote start. You guys don't even think about that anymore. You all got that already. What? Let's go on to the next stage. What's the next thing? I'll tell you what the next thing is. is a guy that moves a car. And he comes with his uh, Ford 250, huge thing. And he's got the big trailer and it has a box on it. And he's standing there and he, he does it remote controlling on, on his phone. It was an app on his phone. He's controlling his car. He's controlling the trailer. He's tipping it, opening it up. What's our world coming to? I can just sit down and get out my app. You know what that sounds like to me? Worship online. Did I just say that? Because we're not doing it online this month. I'm not going to use that line in second service. Just so you know. But isn't it true? And then, you know, I know you're satisfied after you get the vehicle. You go through all that work to get your vehicle. And then as you, you fill it with gas. Ah. And you go to the first place. Where is it? Where do you go first? Kroger? Or some department store? Certainly you don't take your first trip to work. And, and you get there, it doesn't feel good. You open the door and it sounds so nice. You know, everything's solid. Oh, it's just so wonderful. Satisfied? For a while, anyway. And then things start going wrong. Brakes, AC. Satisfaction doesn't last all that long, really. Okay, I'm not going to keep going with the car thing. Maybe it's the house. Oh, I love a house. I want to be satisfied with my house. When are you going to be satisfied? How long is it going to last? How about a job? Oh, I love a job that's very satisfying. How long is that going to last? For how long? Enough? We are people that want to be satisfied. Sin gets in the way. And then sin might cause me because I want to be satisfied to do things I ought not to be doing. Like dishonesty, dissatisfaction, rebellion. And that can work its way into my heart and start pushing out all the wonderful blessings that God has in store for me to the point of even ruining my relationship with God. And that, dear Christian friends, is the top of the mountain, your satisfaction with God. Today, John is going to help us to go up that mountain to think about our relationship with God and having absolute satisfaction. And he does this here by describing for us our condition and then describing for us a solution so that he would give us a message of satisfaction. Uh, as we get into this sermon, there... You know, if we were 50 or 60 years younger, the pastor probably would have started out the sermon and saying, we can look to Jesus Christ who is the propitiation for our sins. And everybody would have gone, yep, got it. I haven't used the word propitiation in how long? Okay, a little quick story so you understand propitiation in case you lost the meaning. So the kids are, the boys are out in the front yard. Let's make it the boys. We'll leave the girls alone soon. The boys are out in the front yard. They're on the street. They're playing baseball. They're having a great time. Every, you know, about back in the day, only they did a dumb thing. They, they took away the, the wiffle ball and they're using a real baseball now. And they hit it. What'd they do? Broke the window. Sure. And so the boy's father comes out and he takes the boy over to the house, knock on the door. You know, they're all hysterical in the house. What just happened? And the dad says, we already called the window guy. He's going to come out and fix it. And the boy says, yeah, I'm really sorry. And the lady accepts the apology. 
and the plan to fix the window, how do you know it's really all better? The lady brings out cookies for the boys. And she probably wants to say it, but she doesn't because she already knows they get it. Don't play baseball in front of my windows anymore. So propitiation means someone who doesn't deserve anything gets something. Propitiation is something that was broken gets fixed and healed. That's the message that John gives us today that we get to share. And very unsurprisingly today, we know the message is the first part, admitting our sins to God. And then the joy of the second part is getting the joy of walking in the light as a forgiven sinner in Christ. All right, John's letter, we know he's writing to. We know he's writing to Christians who are struggling the Christians were struggling because they were being challenged that what they had been taught was enough. That same challenge hasn't changed since day one. And it keeps going on today. More and more people are challenged. Is Christ enough? So John comes with this reassuring message and he wants them to understand where it is they are because of sin. And The Bible uses this all the way through. You know that darkness, if you want to follow along in your bulletin and write in a little blank. I hear more preachers doing this now. (sighs) If you want to, darkness equals sin in the Bible. And light equals God in the Bible. Okay, so what is this darkness? What is this sin? Well, John picks up the whole idea. This is the message we heard from him and proclaimed to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Okay, and then John goes back and forth and back and forth with his examples, and I'm going to put them together to try to just zero in on the point. They're very similar in the way he just constructs them, but they're different. Okay, here's the first one. This is like the first example of the darkness. If, oh, that's it. Should should I read it again? If, in the original language is e'on. You can look it up, ask Google or Siri or everyone. E'on is translated if, and in the King James we used to read whosoever, whensoever, whatsoever, that was that word, uh-uh. In today's English version, it just say if. You've had me in Bible class enough to know whenever you see this if word, just write the word when, right above it. It's a valid translation. Just go, you can listen and, and look at your second reading again. Everywhere it says if, just put when in there. I haven't struck a chord yet, have I? I'll make it simple. When it rains, the sidewalk gets wet. You've heard that before. I've said that before. When A happens, B happens. It's not if as if, uh, well, I don't know if you're ever going to do that or not. No, he is making the statement. When A happens, B happens. Now, with that in mind, let me read it again. Listen. When we say we have no sin, that's the condition of the heart. Okay? He's talking about the condition of the heart. When we say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I know. Nobody here has ever said to me, Pastor, I'm not a sinner. But there's another thought to this. That's not what he's saying. He's saying when you look, when we say we have no sin and scripture clearly says you do, got it? Scripture says this is a sin, but I'm saying I have no sin. Do you want the first example in the Bible? Adam and Eve. 
God said, don't eat from the tree. That was their Bible. And they knew it. And they ate it anyway. So that's the first one. The, the first example that he gives is, I, I know what the Bible says, but I'm not going to listen to it. Then what happens? Here's the rain that gets, that's the rain. Now here's the sidewalk. We deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. All right, let's try the second one. The sec second example, if we say we have not sinned. Now those are the things that come out of us. The sins. Okay. When we say we don't have any sins, we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Again, I've never ha heard anybody in here say, well, I'm not a sinner. But the thought here is deeper than that. It says, by nature, you don't want to confess your sins to God. You're the boy that broke the window. You're the one that break. What's the first thing that hits you when you break the window? Oh, no. Did that really happen? And then what do you do? Oh, no, I'm in big trouble. And then what do you do? Go hide. But dad grabs you before you can go hide and he saves you. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Uh, when we say we have not committed any sins and the Bible says we have, that's what it is. So by nature, we don't want to say I'm a sinner. Nobody here wants to do that. Do you doubt me? Let's start this service over again today. I know you didn't look at the last page in your bulletin. Don't look, but they're all numbered. I put a little number right inside the back cover of every bulletin. And whoever is holding bulletin number nine, we're going to start our service over and we get to the point where it says silent confession of sins. You're going to come up front and turn around and tell everybody the sins you committed last week. What? Is it true by nature I don't want to do that? Even though the Bible says this is healthy for you to do that? Are you going to buy it? You got buy-in? You, you really ready to do that? He's got the promise. He's got the promise. If we say we've not sinned, we make him out to liar and his word is not in us. So then what's the other side of that? Oh, this is the promise. This was the promise King David discovered. When he held his sin and tried to hide it, it killed him. He couldn't sleep. His, his physical ailment, it just, he confessed his sins and what did God do? Healed his heart. Judas, what did his hiding of his sin do to him? Even though he tried to fix it, throw the money back into the temple, killed himself. Ananias and Sapphira, they sold their land and brought the money to the disciples, but they kept a little in their pocket. And they gave it to them and said, here's the money for the property. And then doesn't Peter's conviction? Ananias and Sapphira, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Why did you lie to God? And they fell over dead. We got it? God is not a liar. His word stands true, and so do his promises. That's the message of truth that God has given us to share. It's the message that starts by saying, I'm going to realize what sin is. If you want to think about it systematically, the three answers there in your service folder, you can say, first of all, I'm going to get rid of my attitude towards sin. And that means get rid of the denial. Stop telling yourself, oh, I don't have sin. Stop telling yourself, oh, I, haven't, I haven't committed any wrongs against God. And then after the denial will come the point where we own it. When we realize what we've done is against God and we own it. And then what happens? Well, run. Not away from God. Run to the cross and the empty tomb. 
Admitting your sin frees the chains around your ankle so you can run to the cross and the empty tomb. God keeps his promise. And of course, John talks about this. This is the message that we heard from him, that Jesus, in the upper room for one, and proclaim to, your, to you, God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. You see what this does for us? This helps us to understand that when, we, when our lives are, are all bound up with sin, God gives us this promise that in the admission of our sins, the egg starts to crack. The shell that encompasses us and ruins our hearts is shattered. Admitting our sin is a blessing before God. Yeah, we admit our sins. And then the message that we've heard and proclaimed to you, well, this is, this is what King David came to realize. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. And that's where the satisfying truth starts. When I recognize my sinfulness, the silver lining, I really need a savior. Yeah. You don't need a life jacket unless you're drowning, right? You don't need a fire extinguisher until you have a big fire at your house. But when it happens, Jesus is there. That's what the law does for us. It helps us to recognize how desperately we're in need of a Savior. That's it. So he says, but if we walk in the light, just as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. This is the hope that we confess. This is the the, the love that we hold on to. This is the truth that motivates us every day. This is, the, oh, what is this? The propitiation. That's what I'm talking about. Propitiation. Jesus made it all right. That's what we have so we can enjoy the blessings of that forgiveness won for us in Jesus. What a great message. What a satisfying message. That's what our soul yearns for as it comes into this building. Whether you recognize it or not, your soul is yearning and thirsting for this wonderful message. When I sin and confess my sin before God, I have his promise, forgiveness in Christ. It is Here it is. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe I could just think of it like this, a light switch that gets turned on. Is it on for you? Do you see the light? God? Forgiveness? Careful. Because the devil likes to follow right behind you, and every time you turn on the light switch, he turns it off. Do you have someone in your house like that? You turn on a light, and they come behind you and turn them off? Ask Mrs. Heron constantly turning off lights and i'm constantly turning them on that's what the devil does no i'm not calling june the devil <laughs> i'm just saying the lord knows what we're up against and this is such an important message for us to share with those around us okay the boy that broke the window let's go back to him just for a second you know, the dad takes him to the house and they talk to the lady and, you know, he, the consequences of it. He maybe has to pay for the window, whatever it is. Maybe goes home and gets a spanking. I don't know. But this is what the boy knows. It's taken care of. That sense of relief. And that's the satisfying message that we have. That sense of relief because that light switch has been turned. And we've been enlightened. So we get to joyfully walk in this forgiveness. And because God, the Holy Spirit, knows how our struggles are going to continue on to try to find satisfaction in our life, and the devil is going to turn us in the opposite direction of God's promises, John has to draw us back into his word. My children, I write these things to you so that you will not sin. Okay, look out. Devil's chasing you. Be careful. Be on your guard. If, oh, there it is again. 
when anyone does sin, don't you love this? We have an advocate with the Father. You have the best lawyer anybody could ever want. Jesus. You have an advocate with the Father. Uh, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. There it is. Can I summarize it and say amen? Explain to me the difference between objective justification and universal atonement. And I'll say amen. Jim, you going to let him off the hook? That last sentence is absolutely wonderful. The full payment has been made. Atoning sacrifice. Universal atonement. There's nothing left to pay. Objective justification for the sins of the whole world. What a great message to share. Wouldn't it be great if it was just that easy, you just walked up to people and just rolled off those theological terms and just said, that's it. The greatest message to share. Dear Christian friends, I know that we are living in a day and age where it's getting more and more difficult to walk in the light. The light of, of God. The temptation in, for me, and I, I suspect it's for you, is to just walk in the shadows, not be noticed, not speak to anyone. That's the downfall of the church. Not proclaiming God's word will cause us to shrivel up and blow away. God's not going to send angels to share the message. He's going to use us. And he gave the great promise, when you share that message, God's going to go to work. That's his light shining. Walk in that light. S share this most important news, the satisfying truth. Okay, three quick examples. Number one, how am I going to share this message, this satisfying message? If you're mean at school, stop it. Be nice. You like yelling at people at work, stop it. Be nice. If you're at home and you're grouchy, stop it. Be nice. Because you know the satisfying truth of God's word. When we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us all of our sins. That's guaranteed. That's the promise that he's made for us. Jesus Christ, the light of the world. You, the light of the world, as a witness of Jesus Christ. You want satisfaction? I suppose after church day, you can go buy a new car, go buy a new house, buy some new clothes, buy some new food. None of that's going to last. There's only one satisfying message that lasts forever. The message of Jesus Christ, the, the light in which we walk. Dear Christian friends, as you walk in that light and reflect that light as the light that God has given to the world, don't be afraid. Just like the early disciples boldly going out with the satisfying message of Jesus. Amen.